stand together today. Let's turn to number 380 in our hymnals. We'll begin our service by singing On Christ I Stand, number 380. Number 679 for our next hymn. 679, Tis So Sweet to Trust in Jesus.
Amen. You may be seated and a very good morning to you. It's great to be here together in God's house. I'm so thankful for the time that we have to worship together. And what a wonderful song just now. It is so sweet to trust in Jesus. I hope that that really reflects the condition of your heart this morning, that you're truly trusting in him, not just intellectually believing in a few of the facts that are found in the Bible, but that God has really changed your life. That's seen in your life each and every day as you trust in him. Well, um, as you look around, you might notice there's quite a few people that are out today, sick, traveling. Um, there's, there's two things that I have to say about that. Number one, um, as independent Baptists, it's really a wonderful opportunity to take somebody else's seat. All right. And, and I see that there's at least a couple of you that have done that today. So that makes my heart really glad. Uh, for those of you that haven't, hey, it's, it's your chance to swoop in and really mess them up when they get back. So I encourage that. Um, secondly, um, we're having to dig really deep into the bench today, as you can tell, right? So I'm leading the singing. Um, our, a couple other song leaders are out today. I'm glad to be able to do that. I enjoy the songs. I enjoy the music. Um, but uh, thanks for bearing with me. And uh, pray for my voice that it holds out as we go through all the different functions of the day. But I'm glad to be here with you today. Um, it's a joy to be in God's house. It's a joy to lift up and worship the name of Jesus Christ. And I, I'm looking forward to the time that we'll have to study in God's word. So I'm thankful for each and every one of you. Pray that God um, blesses you and speaks to your heart through the word. It, is, it has really been the prayer of my life all week that there will be some great victories won in people's lives today. And so humble yourself before God's word. And let's make sure that we're submitted and ready to, to receive from him. Uh, we turn our, our hearts and our thoughts to the time of the offering now. And uh, I want to give uh, thanks both to the Lord and to you folks for honoring your commitments that you've made to missions throughout the year. Um, I know a lot of people are giving very sacrificially to meet the needs of missionaries. Um, that is a joy to see. And, uh, and I just thank the Lord for that. And I want to encourage you to keep up the good work. Be diligent in your tithes and offerings. And let's make sure we keep sending the gospel forth all across this world, all right? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. We will commit this time to him today. Our Father, well, we give you thanks today for the real privilege that it is to be able to honor you through the giving of our tithes and offerings. We remember that you're the owner, um, you're the creator of all things, and you merely place these things into our hands that we might be stewards with them. You know, we don't own them ourselves. And so... As you ask us to return to you the, the tenth, the first tenth of our gainful employment and, and also um, to bring offerings, free will offerings before you. We give thanks that we're able to do that. And I pray that you might find us doing so with joyful hearts of worship this morning. Uh, Lord, thank you. Thank you so much for who you are, for your kindness, for your grace that you've shown to us in the person of Jesus Christ and in the amazing work that he's done on our behalf. I pray that we might glory in that today. There will be a sweet sound of worship that sounds up from this assembly, from this congregation. Again, I thank you for each person that's here. Would you meet every need? And I pray that you'd find hearts of humble submission before you that could now kneel before you and offer up the worship that you so richly deserve. And Lord, if there's some area of struggle or, uh, or lack of submission in any heart, whether it's for salvation or whether it's for some area of sanctification or service, I pray that that might be surrendered to you today, and may every life be lived to the very fullest for your glory. Please bless this time now as we give. In Jesus' name, amen.
we're singing some hymns about trusting Jesus today. Number 678, please. 678. On the first now.
All right, well, would you stand with me for the last hymn this morning? And we will turn to number 378. 378, my faith looks up to thee. Well, please take your Bibles and turn to Ephesians chapter 2 this morning. Ephesians chapter 2. And the passage of Scripture before us today is a tremendous one. It's one that, um, to my recollection, was one of the very first Scriptures that I ever memorized. I still know it word for word to this day. I think about it very frequently. I'm very much looking forward to digging into it with you. Well, I heard a, a story of a young fellow once who wanted to be a firefighter. And this is a, a firefighter joke, all right? So um, as many of you know, law enforcement background here, and I know we have much law enforcement empathy in the church, all right? So we're going to pick on firefighters for a minute. This particular fellow had almost everything that he needed to be one. He was in good shape. He was strong. He was quick. He was good looking. That's about all it takes, right? Now, um, he, he knew a lot about fires. He'd even burned his eyebrows off a time or two as a kid. And the only problem was that he wasn't too terribly bright. Just a slow country boy. But the local fire chief thought that the young man might do okay, and so he hired him and gave him a shot. On the very first structure fire that he worked, the fire engine pulled up near the burning building, and the fire chief told the new recruit, get the hoses out so we can put out the fire. While the fire chief was preoccupied with other things, the young man uh, energetically ran around the fire truck, drug the hoses out, and before anybody could stop him, he ran and threw the hoses through the window of the burning building. <laughs> the fire chief yelled, what are you doing? We need those for the fire. 
I know, the young man said. Well, you told me to grab the hoses and use them to put out the fire. <laughs> Chief told him, no, 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 no. Water puts out fires, not hoses. And that day, the house burned down. Well, the chief thought seriously about firing the foolish, simple firefighter, but he ultimately decided to give him another chance. And so, just to get it through the young firefighter's head that it's water that puts out fires, the chief made it the young firefighter's responsibility for several days to empty and refill all the fire trucks several times, all the while repeating the phrase, water puts out fires, not hoses. Water puts out fires, not hoses. Well, a few weeks later, there was another structure fire. All the firefighters jumped into the fire trucks and they responded to the scene of the fire. But when they got there, the fire chief was horrified to discover that though the trucks were filled with, with water, none of the new hoses that they had purchased were anywhere to be found. Seething with anger, the fire chief bellowed for the new recruit, where are all the hoses? And the recruit replied, well, I took them out of the trucks so that we wouldn't be tripping over them when we're trying to put out the fire. And the chief shouted, well, how do you expect us to put out fires without hoses? <laughs> well, but you told me that water puts out fire, not hoses. And needless to say, even though they had all the water that they needed at their disposal, just a few feet away from that fire, that building burned to the ground that day. Now, obviously, um, that is a silly fictional story. No firefighter is that foolish. In fact, nobody that's, a, that's not a firefighter is that foolish. Everybody knows that water puts out fires, not hoses. But did you need the hoses to get the water to the fire? Right? But, but while everybody may know and understand this about putting out natural fires, it seems that many would-be spiritual firefighters are very confused about how to put out the spiritual fires that are burning down lives in the world all around us. There's much confusion about what is needed and how it is applied in order to put those fires out. But God's not confused, not in the least. And he has laid out very clearly in Scripture how to put out the spiritual fires and also how to properly deploy the proper equipment that's needed to put it out. One of the very clearest passages on this subject is Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 10. You'll notice that this passage doesn't actually talk about spiritual fires and putting them out. But the passage is a bit technical, and so I employed the picture of a fire to help us understand it clearly and simply. In Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 10, Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God, gave directions for putting out the fires of eternal judgment. For by grace... Are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works lest any man should boast, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. In this passage, Paul shared how people are saved, and he also shared what they have been saved for. Verses 8 and 9 tell specifically how we are saved. And verse 10 tells what the results should be. Verse 8 gives us our first point. It's a very simple one. By grace are ye saved. You might remember that all through the book of Ephesians up to this point, the focus found back in Ephesians 1, 3, and 4 is that he is unpacking the riches of what God has bestowed upon those who believe in Jesus Christ. It is the, the, the believer's bank account. I mean, these are the treasures that are afforded to mankind through the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, by grace are ye saved. The main idea of the entire passage and of the entire context is this phrase. That is the subject, and we'll be back to that. Please don't forget, that is the subject, that is the focus. How many people here did some sentence diagramming in school? Is that something people do anymore? I don't know. When I was in school, we did a lot of sentence diagramming. If you did... You probably never diagrammed a sentence quite as complex as this one in Ephesians chapter 2. I'm not trying to scare you by saying that, but it's just a reality. But it is fairly simple to break down. In fact, in the Greek, 
the first seven verses really make one long, complex sentence. Chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. And then Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9 make another sentence. And then Ephesians 2, 10 is a third sentence. Now, if you did sentence diagramming, you probably remember that every sentence has one main point. Every sentence has one main thought or subject. And if you were to complete a diagrammatical analysis of Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 7, you would discover that the main idea, the main point, the subject, is the phrase, by grace are ye saved. That's in verse, uh, verse uh, 5 in the parenthetical. And then if you were to do the very same thing with the second sentence in Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9, you would once again discover that the big idea, the main point, the subject, is the phrase at the beginning of verse 8. By grace are ye saved. We can certainly conclude then that Paul's main point in the first nine verses of chapter 2 is that those who are saved are in that condition by God's grace. Since that was Paul's main point, let's make sure that we understand exactly what he was talking about. Some people, unfortunately, get fairly confused about this. The Bible is plain about it, though. The phrase, by grace are ye saved, is really made up of three parts. First, the conjunction for, F-O-R. Second, you have uh, the noun, by grace. And third, the participle, are ye saved. Now, the conjunction for, for by grace, it ties us right back to what we already looked at at this point, or up to this point in chapter 2. Let's, let's briefly glance through the first seven verses to see this and connect the thoughts into what Paul is now saying. Ephesians 2 verses 1 through 3 gave us some very straight talk about our sinful and depraved condition before salvation, didn't it? We were dead in our sins. We walked in the ways of the world, the flesh, and the devil, in obedience to the devil. We conducted ourselves after the lusts of the flesh. Our destiny was God's wrath. Then Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 4 began with two of the most majestic words in the Bible and in the English language, but God. Now, if God had not stepped in and intervened, we would still all be dead in sin and on our way to hell. But God did step in. Not because we had reformed ourselves or made ourselves better people and become more lovable or earned God's favor in some way. No, God stepped in and saved us simply out of his mercy, love, and grace. And Ephesians chapter 2 verses 5 and 6 tell us what Paul meant by salvation in this passage. I mean, there are three things that Paul had in mind when he talked about salvation here. First, we were made alive. This is what we call regeneration. Spiritual life is brought in where there was death before. We were made, secondly, new creatures. uh, I'm sorry, we were made new creatures in Christ. Secondly, according to Ephesians 2, 6, we were raised with Christ, right? So we were given life, And we were raised with Christ. And this talks about our spiritual resurrection when we were given life, folks. Hear me, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, we were raised to a new life in Christ. Not to keep living the same old life, but a new life, a new purpose, a new function, a new way of walking. At the end of verse 6, we were then seated with Christ in heavenly places. Those are what encompass the concept of salvation that he led into in those first verses, uh, that's talking about reigning with him in glory. And with that in mind, Paul said in verse 8, for by grace are ye saved. And this phrase, and indeed the entire passage of scripture, is about our salvation. I I hope that everybody here has that firmly fixed in their minds. That is the subject of this chapter so far. So when Paul said, for by grace are saved, right? In verses 5 and then repeats it again in verse 8, he had in mind our regeneration, our resurrection to a new life, and our reigning with Christ someday. 
It is the whole package, folks. We were saved from the penalty of sin and our souls were saved from God's wrath. As believers, we are now freed from the power of sin as our lives are saved and made to count for him. And someday we'll be freed from the very presence of sin as our bodies are saved from this corrupt world. That's the total of what salvation is. In another uh, portion of scripture, it's called justification and sanctification and glorification. And folks, all of this wonderful, matchless, priceless salvation is, according to Ephesians 2.5 and Ephesians 2.8, by grace. And so we've seen what Paul meant by saved in this passage, but what is grace? What is that? Some might know the little acrostic, and it's not terribly bad, G-R-A-C-E, God's riches at Christ's expense. The definition that I shared with you last week is a bit more accurate and precise. Grace is getting something good that we don't deserve. Some people get bad things that they don't deserve. Like Christ being falsely beaten, or falsely accused rather, and beaten and crucified. People being put into prison unjustly. But that's not grace, right? Grace is getting something good that we don't deserve. It's like a good gift. In other words, salvation was given to us by God even though we did not deserve it. We did not work for salvation. We did not earn it. We did not merit it. It was given to us freely by grace as a gift. And since it is a freely given gift, it must also be freely received to truly be a gift. I mean, just as you cannot force somebody to accept a gift that you want to give them, God cannot force you to accept his grace. Grace, like any gift, can't be forced upon someone but God in his grace freely offers us salvation we didn't do anything to make him offer it to us he offered salvation to us simply because he loves us he is merciful um, and he wants to see us saved though we were sinners and dead in sins and walking in all kinds of filth, there was absolutely nothing lovable about us. God took the first step and he offered salvation to us. That's grace. If we're saved, it's only because of his grace. But you know, offering something is not the same as receiving. And I mentioned this a moment ago, but in any gift exchange, there is one who offers and there's another who receives, right? God has offered salvation to us, every single person here by his grace. And the rest of Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9 tell us how to receive this incredible gift of salvation, this regeneration, this resurrection to a new life and reigning that comes from Jesus Christ. Paul gave three qualifiers. Each one is vitally important to understanding how to get the grace, how to get the salvation, the new life in Christ that Paul had been talking about. Now, now hear me for a moment. If you ever want to know how to be saved, if you ever wanted to know that, if you were confused about it, or if you ever want to tell somebody else how to be saved, you cannot get much clearer than Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. There are three things to remember here, folks. The first is that this salvation by grace package comes to us through faith. Number one, through faith. Look at the text again. For by grace are ye saved through faith. It's not just by grace itself. Another element appears. Another reality in the process. Another ingredient to the recipe, if we could put it that way. It is it is all of grace from God's part. It is infinite, matchless grace. But grace must be received through faith, according to the scriptures. Salvation comes by the grace of God, but through our individual faith. And so, when you tell someone how to be saved, tell them first that they are saved through faith. Some synonyms that we see in the scriptures for faith are Believe, 
confidence, trust. A good definition of faith and a simple one is this. Believing that what God has said, he will do. God says everywhere in scripture that if you believe on Jesus Christ for eternal life, I will give it to you. God promises that all through. That is God's promise. That's God's free offer of eternal life. If we believe the promise, if we believe what God has said, then we have received the free gift of grace. And so the equation works like this. We are saved by grace through faith. Those little words, by and through, are vitally important. By grace, through faith. It's not by faith, through grace. That's what the Calvinist claims. No, it is by grace, through faith. In the fictional firefighter story, uh, firefighter story what did the fireman need to put out the fire? Well, he needed both water and hose. But which of the two actually puts out the fire? The water or the hose? Well, the water, of course. The water is what does that. <clears throat> the fire is extinguished by the water. But the water must flow through the hose to get there. And that is just like salvation. That's what God pictures for us here. The fires of sin that rage within every single person are put out by God's grace alone. He gets all the credit. But we receive God's grace through our faith. If sin is the fire, then grace is the water. But grace needs the conduit of faith to be effective and to be transported to the fire. The fire of sin is put out by the water of grace through the conduit of faith. And so when Paul said, by grace are ye saved through faith, we can visualize that the fire, the wrath of God, has been put out by the water of God's grace through the hose or the conduit of faith, right? Now, the whole matter of salvation that we see here, it is a package deal. Jesus Christ came and died for the sins of the whole world. And more specifically, for your sins. The whole thing is on fire and is destined for fire someday. But Christ's death by itself didn't save anyone. God needed to offer the benefits of Jesus Christ's death to the whole world by his grace, the living water. This is exactly what he's done, folks. It is the continued desire of God's heart, and it is the mission of his churches, which are called the bride of Christ, to bring that to bear in people's lives Revelation 22 and verse 17 says, And the Spirit and the bride say, Come. This is the call. This is what we, we send out to those that are in the fire and that are headed for the fires of hell. The Spirit and the bride say, through this invitation, Come. And let him that heareth say, Come. That's you. And let him that is athirst Come, that's some of you as well. And whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. God has offered the living water of his grace freely to whomsoever wants it, whomsoever will receive it. But we also must understand this, that God's act of offering the gift of salvation does not mean that all are automatically saved. This is very important because there are some who teach that if Christ died for all, then all will be saved. But what they're forgetting is that Christ's death didn't actually save anyone. The benefits of Christ's death are offered to all, but only some receive it by faith or through faith. Scripture tells us everything that we need to receive the grace of God and the benefits of Christ's death for us through faith through the, the conduit, through the hose, that is the delivery system that is designed by God himself. Faith. And where does that faith come from? How is it coupled between uh, the, the heart of man and God himself? Romans 
10.17 emphatically states, Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. This book that we put so much emphasis on that is God's very words and thoughts. God's word reveals the knowledge of Jesus Christ and the work that he has done to pay for our sins. God has chosen that we hear his word through preaching just like this. And when it is heard and you choose to submit to God's way, uh, word, or his way that's found in his word, then faith or trust in the word of God is what actualizes God's gift as it is applied to you directly. It's what couples God's grace to your heart and to your life, cleansing you of your sins and quenching the fire of God's wrath against you. And, and so to sum this up so far, we can say it very simply, almost as Paul has done here. We have been saved by grace alone. I mean, that is the only thing that quenches the fire. Through faith alone, in Jesus Christ alone, found in the Word of God alone. That's what scriptures teach. That's what we embrace and believe. And on the assurance of God's Word in which we place our trust, salvation is then received as a free gift of God. And that's the first condition of salvation that's laid out here in this scripture. It is received uh, through faith. Now second, as we read in the rest of Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 8, we need to remember that this salvation is the gift of God. It is the gift of God. Con so, for by grace are ye saved through faith, continuing in chapter 2 and verse 8, Paul stated, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Now, this is one of the clearest verses in all the Bible on salvation. But for some reason, a lot of people have muddled and confused this passage over the years to try and make it say something that it does not say. They look at this verse and not having done their homework with the sentence structure or the Greek text, they say that the gift of God is, is not salvation. The gift of God is faith. The gift of God is our faith. And they may have good motives for such teaching, but good motives never make good theology. It is good exegesis of Scripture that makes good theology. And so, let me simply tell you, I've done my homework here, as have countless other pastors and theologians and Bible students, and it's not difficult to understand what's being stated here. You can do the homework yourself, and I would encourage you to, and you'll come to the very same conclusions. Now, Calvinists and some others will try to say that the gift of God spoken of, spoken of in this phrase is faith. That is, they claim that God has to give the gift of faith to dead sinners before they can believe. But, but here's a bit of simple grammar. And it is the simple exegesis, again, that anyone in this room could do and arrive at the right conclusions and meaning in this statement or any other in the Bible. So let me give you some, a few little simple Bible tools here. The statement, once again, is, by grace are ye saved through faith, and that, not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Now, the pronoun it in the phrase, it is the gift of God, is neuter in gender, right? Now, English um, doesn't rise to the level of many other languages in many ways. It's kind of a confusing language and, and doesn't have the nuances that many other languages do. English doesn't have the grammatical gender attached to its nouns and pronouns, such as masculine, feminine, and neuter, unless the word it, it, it is literally describing the biological sex of an object. Right? That's the only time that you'll see gender attached. But most other languages do have grammatical gender. And that is the key to understanding this phrase properly. In the Greek language, as in many other languages, the gender of the pronoun pronoun has to match the gender of its antecedent, right? The, the pronoun it is singular and neuter. But faith is a different gender. It is feminine in the Greek language. And so the antecedent then can't possibly be faith because it is neuter and faith is feminine. They, they don't match up. The grammatical uh, propriety doesn't match up. That's not how the Greek language works. So what does that mean? It means that faith in this verse is not the gift of God that Paul was referencing. Here's the key to understanding the verse's grammar. 
It is a neuter pronoun. The word that is a neuter pronoun. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. And so the word that is neuter in gender. It is the only other neuter word in the verse. And so the word that is the antecedent of the word it. And so let me read it again. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Right? So what is the gift of God? Well, faith indeed is a gift of God. We understand that from other scriptures, but it is not the gift that's spoken of in this verse. The gift of verse 8 refers back not to faith, but to the entire main phrase, the subject of this passage. Remember, I emphasized that early on in this, in this message. The gift of verse 8 is that by grace are you saved, right? That is what the passage so clearly teaches. And, and there is no more amazing gift than the one that God has offered to us in Jesus Christ. Though we were headed to eternal punishment and deserve nothing less than that, God sent his son to die in our place. Shed his blood for our sins so that we might be raised to life and reign with him forever. It is the ultimate rags to riches story of all of history. And it's applied to you and I. And God gives it all to you freely as a gift if you simply receive it through faith. I hope it wasn't too tedious walking through that. Hopefully that made sense to you, talking about the grammatical structure. Um, if I just confused you, feel free to ask me afterwards, and maybe I'll be able to articulate it a little bit better in person. But, but once again, um, th there are some who want to sneak man's works in there somehow. You see, some people really don't like to receive free gifts. I know a few people like that. It's, it's really at its base, it is an affront to their pride. They feel that they have to earn what's given to them and that it's not really valuable unless they work for it. It's not meaningful to them unless they work for it. They want to be self-made. And so countless millions of people around the world and throughout human history try to throw their own works or merit into the equation somehow. And Paul knew this. In fact, Paul had spent the younger part of his life in this vain pursuit himself. And now he'd spent a lifetime since he had been saved trying to get people to realize that there are no works involved in this great exchange. It is a free gift of God offered by grace alone through faith alone. Nevertheless, just to make sure there's no confusion about works, he lays it out for us in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 9. This is the third thing he said about the by grace are ye saved through faith package of salvation. Firstly, it's through faith. Secondly, it is a gift of God. Thirdly, it is not of works. Ephesians 2 9 says, not of works, lest any man should boast. Paul's statement is so simple and straightforward that it is amazing to watch the contortions and gymnastics through which some people go to try and squeeze works in somehow. Some try to argue that faith is a work. And so simply by making faith a human condition for salvation, salvation would be by works. I'm picking on Calvinists today. They would say that. But the Bible clearly refutes this in many ways. Romans chapter 4 and verse 5 is one example. There Paul wrote, listen to this, But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. If faith were a work, then that verse would make no sense at all. It would read, but to him that worketh not, but does the work of believing on him who justifies the ungodly, his work is counted for righteousness. I mean, it just wouldn't make any sense. The, the whole verse would be a contradiction. The idea that faith is a work cannot be found anywhere in Scripture. It's not a human work. It's not something that we conjure up somehow. It is simply, as we said, the conduit that connects us to the word of God. Other people just blatantly deny what this verse says and add works anyway. They say things like, well, Jesus has done his 99% and I must do my 1%. I must be a good enough person or do enough religious rituals to offer myself to God and to be okay with him. This position is very popular among Catholics and Protestants, but 1% works is still works. 
just as 1% poison is still poison and will fatally taint the other 99%. Many in evangelical churches try to squeeze works into faith itself. And they say things like, salvation is by faith alone, but not by a faith that is alone. I'll tell you what, not only is that statement pure logical nonsense, but, but it's also completely unbiblical. Those who hold to it say that faith includes obedience to Christ. They argue that there is a true faith that results in works, and there is a spurious or a false faith that does not result in works. But no matter how you cut it, such teachings add works to faith. And Paul clearly said that salvation is not of works in any way, shape, or form. Now, we are going to get to verse 10, so there, there's not a contradiction here in what Paul is saying. We will talk about, about the way that works come in, but it has nothing to do with being attached to faith or, or a product of faith or, or, or a part of faith in the sense of salvation. Finally, um, th there are some who try to add works into the equation after faith, and they say that although salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, and not by works, that we have to have a faith that works, right? In other words, we have to have works after we're saved or we either lose our salvation or we were never saved in the first place. But again, follow the logic. <laughs> in such a situation, works become necessary in order to get to heaven, in order to get to God. In such theology, if there are no works, there will be no heaven. Salvation then in that theology is not by faith alone, but it is by faith plus works, right? That is the Calvinist teaching of perseverance of the saints but Paul was very clear salvation is not of works not of human works in any way shape or form and and, and I want to emphasize to you I'm not playing down the importance of sanctification and holiness and living for God and being totally transformed in every way once you're saved we'll get to that in a moment um, but we're talking about salvation here it is not dependent upon works either prior to salvation or in conjunction with salvation or following faith man's works play absolutely no part in being made alive in Christ being raised in Christ or being seated with Christ why not lest any man should boast in other words, if salvation were of works, even a tiny microcosm of your works, we would be able to boast that we saved ourselves or had some part in saving ourselves. And we most certainly would boast. Every last one of us would boast and boast and boast, even if God did 99.9% of it and we did 0.1% or 0.01%. I mean, it doesn't matter how small of an amount, we would boast in it. That's human nature to do so. Again, remember the analogy of the fire. What puts out the fire? The water or the hose? The water does. Can the hose boast and say, well, look how I put out the fire? No. The hose did absolutely nothing in putting out the fire. The, the, the fire was put out by the water. In the same way, faith is not a work because it does nothing to save us from the penalty of sin. All it does is allow grace to save us. Um, it, it, it anchors us to the promises of God in his word about Jesus Christ. God did it all for us in Christ already, and he applies it to our lives by his grace through the conduit of our faith. Works plays no part in our justification. But now I want to flip a bit here and say that that does not mean that works play no part in our lives as Christians, right? Has no part of our salvation but it does have something to do with our lives as Christians. And so secondly, we find one of the reasons that God saves people, right? So our first point this morning was, by grace are ye saved, and then we broke down the components of that. But secondly, beyond reconciliation through the payment of Christ for our sins, beyond our souls just being cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ, we find that we are saved for good works, not by good works in any way, but we are saved for good works. I hope that you understand the difference. Works play no part in us becoming Christians or staying Christians. Works play no part in whether we go to heaven or go to hell. But 
Uh, and this is very important to understand. Although works play no part in how we become Christians, works play a large part in living as a Christian should. As a Christian must. Although works play no part in getting us to heaven, works do play a large part in what kind of reception we will get in heaven. In fact, in another portion of Scripture, Paul talked about how in our obedience and service to the Lord, an abundant entrance into heaven or being ushered into heaven will be given to God's people. We're going to be talking about all of this in the weeks and months ahead in this study and so we'll get into it in detail, but we see it introduced here in Ephesians chapter 2 also. Ephesians 2.10 says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Now throughout this message, I've been using the picture of a fire to help us understand these verses. And so far we've seen that if sin and God's wrath are like this consuming fire, then grace is like the water, the living water that puts it out. And faith is like the conduit through which the water travels to be applied to that fire. Many of us have seen or experienced fires, haven't we? When a building burns and a fire crew comes and puts out the flames, is that the end of the story? No. I mean, let's say, God forbid that your house burns and the fire department comes and puts the flames out when they're done can you round up the kids and just charge back into the house as if nothing happened at all <laughs> and does life just go on as normal no of course not not unless you want to live with charred furniture and smoke damage and holes burnt in your roof and ash on everything and a weak structure it takes a lot of work to put your house back together again at that point in time in fact, a little less than two months ago, um, Sister Vivian and her husband's fourplex caught on fire while we were out at the church camp in Salcha. Now, fortunately, everybody escaped unharmed, but there was extensive damage done to the units. The fire department showed up, they put out the fire, but the cost to rebuild is tremendous, and the work involved in abatement and reconstruction is tremendous. The whole thing has to be gutted, much has to be eliminated and removed. Several new walls must be constructed. A new roof has to be installed. All the interior and exterior finish work has to be done. The fire was put out the right way, but a lot of cleanup and rebuilding is needed now. It's the same in our lives, folks. It's not a perfect metaphor, but it's similar. Verses 8 and 9 tell us that God put out the fire. Praise God for that. He put out the fire by grace through faith. It was a free gift. There was no cost to us. We didn't have to do anything. No works of any kind. But once the fire's been put out, there's a lot of work to do. There's a lot of work to do. Everything has to be restructured from the ground up. I want you to think about this as it applies to your life as a Christian once you get saved. Reconstruction from the ground up. All the old trash must be gutted and hauled to the dump. Strong new structural supports must be installed. All the interior work of character building and wisdom and faithfulness must be developed. And all the exterior finished work of how we look and how we talk and how we behave must be carefully redone. Paul says in Ephesians 2.10 that if the fire of your sin has been put out, if you have placed faith in Jesus Christ for eternal life, and if you have a new life in him, you need to start cleaning up your life. You need to start shoveling out the trash. You need to start abating the property. You need to start sweeping the rooms, washing the walls, throwing out all the damaged possessions and replacing them with new. You know, you can continue to live in the damaged house the way that it is if you want to, but who would? <laughs> who wants to sleep in a soot-filled bed? Who wants to eat food from a burned-out refrigerator? If you're a Christian, you're not actively pursuing a life of holiness and careful obedience to God, you're living in a fire-damaged house. And it's no wonder why you may be struggling in your Christian life without the joy and the wonder and the richness that you ought to have. Paul made it plain that fixing up of our lives is why God put out the fire. He said in verse 10, For we are 
his workmanship. In other words, God's going to help us. He made us originally. He has the blueprints and the architectural drawings. He has the resources. He knows what needs to be done to clean up our lives appropriately. If you go off and try to do it on your own, you'll end up with a very unstable and unsafe life. Weak and ready to fall down with the first storm that comes by. Because we are his workmanship, God knows what's best for us. And he's told us what this is in the Bible. We just need to read it and obey it, folks. I mean, it, it really is that simple. People try to complicate this so much, come up with arguments and, and, and dance around the matters. We just need to read it and obey it. We need to hear the preaching and the teaching and the counsel from those God's placed in our lives and receive it and put it into application. No delaying. Next in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10, he said that we are, his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works. The good works that we are created to do, I've already emphasized this, they are not to gain salvation. They are for those who are already saved, for those who are in Christ. The Bible is not silent on these matters either. God's will in these matters is plainly known. We're going to see them as we walk, in, walk on through Ephesians. Paul said that we are God's workmanship. The new life that we have is because we're in Christ Jesus. And because we're in Christ Jesus, we should live like Christ Jesus. And do the things, Paul says in the next, uh, next in verse 10, that God prepared beforehand that we should walk in. This list is called the Word of God. God prepared it beforehand. He made this list before we were ever saved. He made this list for everyone who would be saved, for you, for me, for everyone who is a, a, truly a believer in Jesus Christ who's received new life. They've been raised to a new life. Now you apply what God has to say about that new life. And, and not just so that we can look at it. He hasn't prepared this list so we can just hang it on our refrigerator and, and say, I've got the list. Isn't that nice? Right? That's cute. No, God prepared this list so that we should complete the list. How many of you have honeydew lists or something like that? A list of some sort. It gets hung on the refrigerator. It gets hung somewhere else in the house. It's a long list. It just seems like it keeps growing. And you never get any of it done. Well, God said, no, you, this, this list is so that you can complete it. Paul actually said, so that we should walk in them. Walk in them. The word walk comes from the Greek word peripateo. The, the root, peri, we got our word periscope. It, it means around. It means all around. 360 degrees. And it means, in this case, peripateo means to walk all around. And to go back to our analogy of the fire, it's like Paul's saying, hey, the fire's been put out. Don't you want to be able to walk about in your house like you ought to. Don't you want to use your house for its purpose? Don't you want to live in your house? Don't you want to use every square inch of it, maximizing it in an optimal way? Well, before you can do that, you've got to complete the list that God has given you of things to do. And, and you do it as you, as you continue to live and walk before the Lord. You have all the resources that you need to do it, it's just a matter of submitting and dis disciplining yourself to get those things done. God equips all of us with the capabilities to do that. There is nothing that God asks of any person here that is extravagant or that goes beyond what's reasonable. In fact, we see in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, that God has designed that you and I would present our bodies as believers a living sacrifice to God. He owns it all. There's no, there's no contesting it. We're not balking at anything. We're not holding anything back. But it's all laid on the altar before God. And it says that that, that is your reasonable service. It's not exceptional service. It doesn't go beyond what everybody else does or, or, or into some level of, of the paranormal. No, it's your reasonable service. It is like the baseline. That's what God expects. Now, I'm talking to God's people right now. I challenge you this week to walk about in the house that is your life. Do it right now. Do it as we have an invitation in just a moment. Let God's Holy Spirit search your heart, search your own heart in light of the scriptures and what you know. 
it's been damaged by the fires of sin. Every one of us. But God, by His grace, through our faith, has put out the fire that threatened our souls. And now He fully intends to help us rebuild so that that house can be all that God intends it to be. So each one of us needs to walk about that damaged house, carefully examining each and every room in the light of God's Word, seeing what God's list points out for us to fix. And then immediately, diligently, and joyously do it. That's why, according to verse 10, God saved us. That's why. We were created in Him unto good works. Let's not fail in what God has saved us to do. Let's not squander what God saved us to do. Now, you likely know some things right now that you need to surrender to God. Won't you do that right now? For those who are not saved, how can you be saved? The Philippian jailer asked the question to Paul, what must I do to be saved? Probably the clearest question regarding salvation in all the Bible, and it received probably the clearest answer, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. If you're not saved this morning, you are lost and hopeless in the clutches of sin and its destructive power. But you can be saved by God's grace alone. Through faith in Jesus Christ, God promises to give eternal life to anyone who understands their desperate condition and simply believes in Christ for it. No strings attached, no fine print. It's a free gift to all who believe in Christ. Have you done that? God calls you to do that right now. Don't delay. You and I don't know that the fire of your sin is going to rage out of control and destroy you once and for all. Don't put it off. Let's pray. Father, I give you thanks for the opportunity to open up your word. And I thank you for the simplicity of it once again, for how you make it so understandable to simple people like us. I thank you, though, for the power of it, for the way that your grace, unspeakable, unimaginable grace, so rich and free, is given to us. I pray that every person here would be vitally connected to the word of God, putting their faith and their confidence in what the scriptures have to say about Jesus Christ, his death, burial, and resurrection for the sake of their sins. And I pray that if any person has not, uh, has not yet ever committed that to you and received you, that even this morning they might fall on their knees before you, they might humble themselves and receive the free gift of salvation. Lord, work some miraculous victories in hearts this morning. And may all of your people be honest before you today and do the introspection that's needed and allow you to search their hearts and lives. May we be what you've created us to be. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Would you take a hymnal and stand with me? We're going to close with a song. I don't want this song to be a distraction to you. There's wonderful words to this song. We're going to sing number 478. It's a hymn called Only Trust Him. It's about as simple as the message was today. Only trust Him. But I don't want you to be distracted by it. If you need to take care of something before the Lord, I challenge you to do it right now. And that might involve just bowing before the Lord where you're at. It might be if you want to come up front here and bow down at the, at the altar at the front. If you need some further counsel, you need to slip off somewhere else to a quiet place. Would you do that as we close this time? Number 478.
sing the fourth verse in just a moment. The call is to receive Jesus Christ as your Savior. If you have not done that before, do it now. It's a matter really of just bowing the knee. I'm not even physically speaking. I'm using that as a metaphor. But bowing the knee before Jesus Christ and submitting to his truth that we've talked about today. And then uh, the the call in verse 4. Come then. Come then and join this holy band. Many people here that have trusted in Jesus Christ and that are on their way to heaven and and that have their sins paid for by the blood of Christ, come join us. What a a joyous walk it is to be able to serve the Lord. Let's sing this fourth verse together. Come then and join this holy the time together this morning. I trust that it's been a blessing and a challenge to your heart. Um, It doesn't conclude here. The Lord's work continues to go on, and we have much still to take place today, and uh, including the classes this afternoon. Let's pour our whole hearts into what we're doing in the Lord's ministry, folks. Um, It's been a joy already, but there's still some some great teaching and victories to come, and then, of course, the time of ministry on Fort Wainwright this evening. Let's bow before the Lord in prayer. We do have a a time of uh, fellowship and a meal downstairs. We'd invite everyone to stay for and enjoy um, some exhortation from one another. And uh, let's uh, commit that time to the Lord as well. Father, I give you thanks once again for the opportunity to gather with these people. I pray that, um, that you'll be well pleased with every single heart and with the submission that they show before you as we even walk out of these doors in just a moment. I pray that you'd bless the time of fellowship and the meal to follow. May it be uplifting. May it be edifying. I pray that you would use this hospitality time to draw people's hearts closely to one another, um, to bond them in unity around your truth and around the Savior. Please bless the food as well. Thank you for all those that have worked so hard to prepare it and to prepare for all of the other facets of the ministry today. In Jesus' name, amen.